Welcome to this special edition of The Upper Room. We are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus as uh, we're hoping that you get this lesson in time to use it for Easter celebration this year. And I'll tell you what, it is a pleasure to come to you from the banks of the Jordan River. <laughs> Just kidding. I wish we were on the banks of the Jordan River. Wouldn't that be great? We're actually on the banks of the Gunnison River. Not near as famous as the Jordan River. <laughs> the place where we have landed here with the river behind us is a place where the river has already wound its way through the beautiful Black Canyon. And now about 40 miles downstream it'll join up with other rivers and make the Colorado River. But we're here for a specific purpose, and we're going to get into that in just a moment. Speaking of the Jordan River, uh, our dear friends, the Paulsons, who lead the house church in Tucson, Hi Paulson House Church, <laughs> they were recently in Israel, and believe it or not, they texted me as they were getting ready to go to the Jordan River, and they were asking a really good question that uh, people have asked me before, and I'm no expert on this answer, but they ask, should we get rebaptized in the Jordan River? And my basic answer to them and to everyone who's ever asked that, see, I've never been to the Jordan River, so I'm not sure what I would do, but my basic answer is, you don't need to, but it could be fun. <laughs> if I remember correctly, I think three in their family did and two did not for various reasons, but you know, it's a great question, and so I want to pose that as our opening discussion question. If you were at the Jordan River, if this wasn't the Gunnison River, but you were at the Jordan River, would you want to be baptized again? I'm assuming most of you have been immersed in the waters of uh, baptism. Would you want to do it again or not? Why or why not? Have a great discussion. Over the years, I've been so privileged to get to baptize quite a few people, and uh, some of my favorite places have been in rivers or the ocean. Uh, it's just, there's something just so great about it because we know that Jesus was baptized in the river, of course. I'm hoping to uh, find the pictures we have of Wes Gowan. He's a gentleman in our house church, and of him baptizing two of his sons, John and Henry, in the Uncompagre this last year. So I pull those up, I'll show those to you, but I think it's a great experience. It's a very cool thing to do that. Now, over the years, baptizing quite a few people in different places, probably my two favorite things that ever happened. When I was growing up, the preacher, a guy by the name of Lloyd McMillan, always used waders, like, you know, that, that fly fishermen use. He always slipped those on real quick to baptize people. So I always believe that's what you have to do. And in fact, the guy I interned under, a guy that followed him, a guy by the name of Ronnie Hanna, did the same thing. He would pull up those waders and cinch them tight so he could still stay in his suit and he would baptize people. So in the beginning of ministry, I would do the same. I would use waders and pull them up until one time I was baptizing somebody, tried to pull those waders up. They're a little bit big for me and as I dipped the person down, my waders filled with water. <laughs> I could have drowned actually. <laughs> they filled with water and I almost began to float. And then I realized from that point on, let's not mess with the waders. Let's just go in, get wet, put on shorts, get wet like the people you're baptizing. No big deal, dry off. So I quit messing with the waders after that incident. Another time I was baptizing a guy who was very tall, like 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, and I told him, as I told everybody when we baptized them, to make sure and bend your knees when we go down, you know, so it's much easier to bring you back up. Well, some people get nervous and they forget to do that, and he got nervous and forgot to do that and was stiff as a board. <laughs> well, I got him back up, but in between the time I took him down and got him back up, he banged his head on the back of the wall. <laughs> I think the whole church could hear it. <laughs> Those are my two favorite memories of baptisms, and I, I just think it's such a cool thing to get to do that. And for the most part, when fathers or parents want to baptize their kids or want their kids baptized, I always recommend that they be the ones to do it because it is such a privilege and honor. And so, 
We're here in front of the river talking about baptisms. And baptism will play a role in what we're going to talk about today. Simply put, today is about answering three questions. We won't spend a lot of time on any of them. You have your time of discussion where you can go deeper into them. The first question is very simply, did Jesus rise from the dead? Secondly, assuming he rose from the dead, what are the implications right here, right now? And then third, assuming he rose from the dead, what are the implications for the future? Those are the three questions we're going to cover pretty succinctly, but it's, I think it's a great way to get into the Resurrection Sunday that we're celebrating. Okay, so for that first question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Simply put, easy answer actually, yes, of course he did. And I'll read a passage to you that really helps us understand that and then give you a couple quotes to help you delve into that a little bit. But it, it's not a difficult one, really, this question. He indeed rose from the dead. I take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, turn there. And Paul is writing. Remember, Paul was no fan of the church. He was no fan of Jesus. He was no fan of Jesus' followers. In fact, before he was converted in Acts chapter 9, remember, he was actually imprisoning and killing followers of Jesus. So you're talking about a guy who has credibility when it comes to talking about the resurrection of Jesus because he spent a lot of time believing it was all a hoax and it wasn't worth his time and people who believe that should be put to death or imprisoned. Okay, then he writes this to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 3. I passed on to you what was most important. Wow, what's the most important thing, Paul? Is it is it the, uh, the pre-tribulation that we need to understand? Or is it uh, Calvinism that we need to delve into? What is the most important thing, Paul? Because we have an array of things, right, that we think are most important. Should the church accept the woke ideology of the world? What, what's the most important thing, Paul? He goes on. And what also has been passed on to me? The most important thing. So you really want to hear this. Here it is. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. It's a fact, he says. I doubted it. I hated the people who followed Jesus. But I got to tell you, I now know, delving into it, he was a very intelligent man, part of the Sanhedrin court, a Pharisee. And he says, without a doubt, he died for our sins. He was buried and he rose on the third day. And now he goes on to give more information. In case you're doubting him, verse 5. He, meaning Jesus, was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of them are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. I love what he says there. If I had been born at the same time that all those guys were born, maybe I'd have been with them in this thing. I wasn't, but he still appeared to me. Listen to the evidence he gives. This is strong evidence. He appeared to more than 500 people after he rose from the dead. That can be checked out. And I'm sure he invited everyone who was listening to him to go check it out. Most of those people, because this was some 30 years later now that he's writing this, 25 to 30 years, most of those people are still alive. Some have died, he said. But that is incredible evidence. Any historian, and again, all you have to do is do the homework to find out that Paul was an actual man in history. Jesus, obviously, even secular historians know that he was a man who uh, claimed to be the Son of God. And so, when he says this, and you look into it, you find out, yeah, this is a no-brainer. Well, what did some other people think about that? Charles Spurgeon put it this way. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is one of the best attested facts on record. There were so many witnesses to behold it, that if we do in the least degree receive the credibility of men's testimonies, we cannot and we dare not doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. Spurgeon is right. If you do the homework, if you do the, the research, historically, there are so many people who witnessed that. And oh, by the way, they could have killed Christianity in the womb before it ever got going by producing the body of Jesus Christ. 
Fast forward to the late Charles Colson. In case you're not understanding who Charles Colson is, uh, he was in that inner ring of President Nixon's confidants, and he says this, and this is so perfect. So here's what Colson said. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they could not keep that lie a secret for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. What a great analogy Colson gives us. Not only did Jesus raise from the dead all the testimonies and the accounts of his life affirm, but he also signified it. We're going to go deeper in this, but I want to mention this. So we go to Matthew chapter 3. All right, Matthew chapter 3. This is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, starting in verse 13. Here we go. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. He said, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. So why are you coming to me? Now, why would he say that? Because he has known of Jesus. He's his cousin. And he knows he is sinless. He's watched him. He knows he's the Son of God. And so he responds the same way I believe you and I would. And that is, I am a sinful person. Why would I baptize a sinless person? Because John had been baptizing for repentance towards righteousness, but Jesus didn't need that. And I've had many parents say, well, I don't think I can baptize. I'm not, I'm not qualified. It's not about your qualifications, and that's what Jesus is about to tell his cousin John. And in verse 15, Jesus responds, It should be done. For we must carry out all that God requires. Your translation may say that we must fulfill all righteousness. And so John agreed to baptize him. This is fascinating. We're going to get into this a little deeper in a little bit here. But uh, the imagery here is unbelievable. Luke chapter 1 tells us that John the Baptist came from the lineage of Aaron, the priesthood, the line of the priesthood. Both his mother and father came from Aaron's priesthood. Now think about that. What did the high priest do? Once a year, he would oversee the sacrifice of the lamb, okay? And so it's fitting that one who came from the priesthood of Aaron would oversee the lamb of God coming to begin his ministry that would end in the sacrifice. And again, after, I think it's the day after he baptizes him, John the Baptist says to everybody around him, he points at Jesus and says, so appropriately, behold the Lamb of God. Do you, do you get the thick irony in that statement that he makes? We go on, and it says in verse 16, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water. Okay, just a, again, a quick break. Back in the Middle Ages, specifically 1311, I guess the Roman Catholic Church decided that submerging people under the water and bringing them back up was too difficult, too challenging, too complicated, I don't know, but that's when they instituted sprinkling. And that's a problem. And the reason it's a problem is that first of all, Jesus went down into the river and came back out. If he was just gonna be sprinkled on, then all they'd have to do is reach down and throw some water on him. He was submerged, and the reason that's important is because it's all about imagery. And so the imagery of going under the water and coming back out is that image of death, burial, and resurrection. And so there is no way that simply splashing some water on him would keep that imagery together. So again, in verse 16, he comes up out of the water. The heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Don't miss it. It's not about the water. It's not about the river. It's about the fact that whoever was there that day got to experience the triune God actively participating in one event, the sun being buried underwater, the spirit 
coming down like a dove on him and the Father speaking from heaven. Ah, he brings me such joy, my son. Second discussion question, why do you think it was that this act of baptism would fulfill all righteousness, as the many translations say? What does that mean to you? So the translation I'm using here says it's what God requires. Now why would God require it? I think there's two reasons. Reason number one would be that it literally shows that Jesus would never ask us to do something he would not do. Jesus never asked his followers to do something he wasn't willing to do. And he has asked that we be baptized. Check out Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 16. Uh, Acts 2.38, of course, we are, are asked, we are commanded to be submerged, immersed under water, literally. He literally did what he would ask us to do. I hope that gives you great confidence in Jesus. He's not the kind of leader who says, go do that. I'm not going to do it, but you should do it. He showed us the way. So that's literally what he was doing. Figuratively, as I mentioned, this is huge. He was giving an image, a picture of what was to come, a foreshadowing of what was to come. And that is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we'll get into that in Romans chapter 6. Jesus also used the term baptism uh, as something to help people understand something you have to identify with or you have to undergo. And I'll take you to Luke chapter 12 verse 50 where he's talking to his disciples and he says, I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me, and I'm under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. Then in Mark chapter 10, verse 38, the context here is that James and John have come to him and said, hey, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, will you command that we get to sit at your right and left hand? Like, that's no big request, right? We want to be second in charge. <laughs> and in this passage, it says, but Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Remember we talked about admonishment in the last lesson? This is admonishment. You don't have a clue what you're talking about. He goes on to say, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized into the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? And if you know the response, they're like, uh, yeah. We're so clueless, aren't we? <laughs> sure. I don't know what that means, but sure, count us in. Okay, I was baptized. I was immersed into Christ in what is called the watery grave of baptism 53 years ago this weekend. And I tell you that so that you know that I'm under no illusion that that water was magical. There's nothing magical about the water, nor is there anything really magical about who did it. I know who did it. Again, it's that pastor named Lloyd McMillan who baptized me on that day um, and yet what it meant is this is the beginning that was my beginning that was my entrance into being united with Jesus really important just like it was the beginning of Jesus ministry that beginning is really important now a lot of people unfortunately think that that's the end I got baptized that was it I go on living for myself we're going to find out here in a second. That is not the case whatsoever. I love that marker. I can still picture today. I know who was there. I, I just, I relive it all the time. That day when I was immersed into Christ and I came out of those waters. And it's so important, not because again, it's super magical or spiritual, but because it's a marker. The marker was set there. And from that point on, I'm all in. I'm all in with Jesus. And that was some 53 years ago. I have not regretted what I did 53 years ago one time. Not one moment have I regretted that. Again, so the baptism of Jesus in the river, not the Gunnison, but the Jordan, was imagery that was really predictive of what would happen to him. So the first question was, did Jesus rise from the dead, from the grave? And the answer is really a simple yes. All of history points to that. Second question is, what then are the implications for us today? There's a gentleman who has uh, since gone to be with the Lord, but he was uh, heavily involved with the Institution of Creation Research. His name is Henry M. Morris, 
And here's what he said about it. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. Get that. What are the implications for today? What you decide about the resurrection dictates whether Jesus is who he claimed to be, whether our trust in him is merited, or whether it's an absolute waste of time. So I mentioned we're going to go to Romans chapter 6. Turn there, if you will, because, again, back to the imagery for today, for us. It's very powerful. We'll pick up Paul's writing in chapter 6, verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Okay, so what's he talking about? Is it literal or figurative? That's the big question, right? Is he talking about a, a literal go into the water kind of thing? Or is he talking about an immersion into Jesus, identifying with him? The answer is yes. He's talking about both, I believe. When you say the word baptism, you're actually speaking Greek. You know, there's words in the Greek that are translated, like agape is translated into love for us. But when you say baptism or baptizo, that is actually a Greek word that we have transliterated letter by letter. And so you're speaking Greek, you know Greek. You can say baptizo or baptism. And here is what it means. Listen to this. And we get this definition from Kenneth S. Wust. And he says this, the introduction or placing of a person or a thing into a new environment or into union with something else so as to alter its condition or its relationship to its previous environment or condition. Did you get that? It, it is pictured, uh, the water going underneath the water and coming back up is an image of what he just described. I'm now entering into something new that is unlike what I've ever been in before. All right. I'm united with Christ. I've never been that way before. I used to be united with the world. And now I am doing something that brings me into unity with Jesus. Again, it's not water that saves us. There were some uh, leaders as I was growing up that really kind of believed that. It's called water regeneration, that the water actually washes your sins away. That's not it at all. It is the pledge of the covenant that you have now entered into to be united, submerged into Jesus, and he then is submerged into your life. And it's simply when that happens in a river or wherever is an image, is a picture, is a representation of what is happening inward. Paul goes on in verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Okay, that's why this imagery is so important. As I'm buried with him, I come up to live a new life. That old life is gone. It was buried under the water. Again, my old life didn't stay under the water, but the image is that old man died and a new man rose, even though I was only seven years old. The old life is over. The new life has come. That's what that is a picture of that we need to grasp a hold of because the implications of the resurrection of Jesus hit us today in that we do the same thing. We identify with his death in that the old man dies. We identify with the new life as we are raised up to walk a new life. And that's really important because many of us continue to live as though we're still tied to the culture. And that can't be because that's not a new life. That's just a different life. I go back to A.W. Tozier when he said, culture is putting out the light in men and women's souls. When you continue to identify with the culture, if I continue to identify with the culture, it will put the light out in my soul. It'll absolutely infiltrate who I am. 
I died to that. That's what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's not, I live a little differently. No, I have a brand new life. I am now united with him, submerged into him, uh, a figurative baptism that is shown by a literal baptism. That's why it's so powerful for the here and now. It identifies not just with his death, but even more importantly with his resurrection as we are a new person when we come resurrected into this life with Jesus. He goes on now in verse eight of chapter six. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has any power over him. And that's what he goes on to say. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Once and for all, Jesus put the clamps on death and said, you no longer have the power over me and you no longer will have the power over my followers. Timothy Keller, the pastor from Manhattan, put it this way, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? He goes on to say, the issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Get that. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead changes everything for us right here, right now. If I reject the fact that he rose from the dead, okay, I go on living for myself and living like the culture. But if he did raise from the dead, which we know he did, now everything changes because it's not just about his teaching it's not just about what people say about him it is the fact it's not a feeling it's a fact that he rose from the dead it changes everything in fact our entire faith depends on this fact be it true or false turn now if you would in your bibles to first corinthians chapter 15 we're going to delve into it again with paul starting in verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. You see, it all comes down to that. It's not, well, I grew up in the church, and I really like stained glass windows, and I get a good feeling at those potlucks. That is not what the point is. The point is, Jesus rose from the dead, yes or no. If he did, I'm a different person. He goes on in verse 15 to say this, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. So he's saying there's implications now about him being risen from the dead. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. What is the point? What is the point? You and I have to come to grips with the fact that this is the one and only issue. Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? If he did, everything has changed. If he didn't, nothing changes at all. We all stay the same. He moves on to verse 20. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Notice he used the word fact. The fact is he has been raised from the dead. He says, I know personally, I've met him. He goes on to say he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Your translation may say the first fruit. We'll talk about that. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, that's Adam, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, that's Jesus. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given a new life. The here and now, what difference, what impact, what influence does Jesus' resurrection have on us today? I get a new life. I have a brand new life. Not a better life, not a different life, a brand new life. Everything in the past is gone. I start with a clean slate. What a life. This is what it all comes down to. And we need to have the attitude of the theologian Phil Robertson, <laughs> who said this, basically, I don't ever move too far past the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because it's of first importance. And I make sure it's of first importance with anyone I'm talking to. It all comes down to that, really, when you get right down to it. So it's not complex. 
Jesus removed our sins and guarantees we can be raised from the dead, which moves us into the third question. What then, since Jesus rose from the dead, is the implication for the future? And Robertson just said it. We will be raised from the dead. We have been raised from the dead. That's the here and now. I had a, my life was death. I've been raised from that for a new life. Now, in the future, I will be raised again. I take you back to the verse we just read, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But there is an order to this resurrection. Okay, this is what I want you to start to see. I want to show you something really cool in a minute. There is an order to the resurrection. There is the resurrection of Jesus' baptism, comes out of the water. There's the resurrection, resurrection. There's the resurrection of Jesus from the grave, the actual tomb. And there's the order of our resurrection for a new life. And now there is the final resurrection. So again, he says, but there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So he was the first fruit. He was the, the quality. He was the, the very first part of this process of resurrection. Started with him. It was pictured in the Jordan. Then it went on with his resurrection from the tomb. Now we are raised from a dead life and we eventually will be raised from actual death in, on this earth. Theology professor Richard B. Gaffin explains it this way. Paul is saying here that the resurrection of Christ and of believers cannot be separated. Do you get that? We have no resurrection if Jesus isn't risen from the dead. They, we are connected in this. Why? Because to the extent the metaphor, as Paul surely intends, Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of the resurrection harvest that includes the resurrection of believers. And he goes on to say that that idea came from the verse we just read, verse 23. The great evangelist Billy Graham put it this way, the entire plan for the future has its key in the resurrection. What difference does Jesus' resurrection make in the future? Our future is different because he rose from the dead. I don't know if you've ever been in a courtroom when the judge comes in. You've certainly seen it on TV shows and movies. The judge walks in. What does the bailiff say? All rise, right? Why? Out of respect for the judge. And then the judge says, you may be seated as he sits down. It is out of respect for his role and what he represents. All rise. Watch how this ties in to who Jesus is and our response to Jesus. First of all, Jesus is the ultimate judge. As you know, I'll remind you, Revelation 19, 11, Then I saw heaven open, John says, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider, you know who it is, was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. Let me take you to Acts chapter 24, verse 15, where Paul says, There shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So when we say all rise, where does that idea come from? Isn't it just the believers who rise? Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 25. And I assure you that the time is coming, indeed is here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life, giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge anyone because he is the son of man. Don't be so surprised indeed. The time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's son and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. Those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. I don't know if you realize that, but all humanity will rise when he comes back to meet the judge. Those who know him will pass into eternal life. Those who do not will be judged for all that they have done. So that term, all rise for the judge is coming in is very significant for the future. Back once again to Revelation 20 verse 11, I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it, 
The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Jump down to verse 15. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Make sure you understand this. We will all rise. We will all then probably kneel before the judge. And those whose names are in the book of life go one direction. Those who did not desire to know Jesus will not have their names written down in that book of life. Now they must try to defend how they lived and we know how that ends. It ends in the lake of fire. The point is all rise is truly going to happen. N.T. Wright puts it this way. In the New Testament, outside the Gospels and the beginning of Acts, again and again, the fact of Jesus' resurrection is closely linked to our own ultimate resurrection, which isn't life after death, it's life after life after death. Let's see if you can get your mind around that idea. Okay, so I want to tie all this together. Uh, hopefully you're, you're tracking with me on this. This is so significant. You know by now that God, uh, the way he connects with us, the way he communicates with us is often, often through images, through pictures, through themes, right? Uh, if, if you don't realize that, check out Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, what is Mount Moriah? Well, that's where Abraham was told to go to offer up his son, his one and only son, right? And he was obedient, even though God gave a sacrifice instead of his son. That was Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is also where the temples were built, all right? And Mount, where, where sacrifices were made by the probably millions. And then Mount Moriah, whether you talk about a region or a specific place on a specific mountain, is where Jesus gave himself as the ultimate sacrifice, the one and only son. And there was not a substitute for him. He was our substitute. Look at the imagery there over thousands of years. Isn't that beautiful? And God does this all the time, right? With the rainbow. The rainbow is an image of his covenant that he will not flood the earth again. Circumcision, the Sabbath, all those things were images that he had lived out by the people of the old covenant so that they would never forget how special they were, what kind of covenant they were a part of, and how the surrounding nations could identify who they were. And Jesus just continues that with this image. And it's, it's going to be in four parts, all right? Now look at this kind of foreshadowing that happens, a chain of actions that will take place that we've already covered, but I'm going to just summarize them all, okay? First of all, what we're talking about is the forerunner as John the Baptist being the forerunner of Jesus, okay? That's not debatable. All you have to do is turn to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, to see that John the Baptist was the forerunner. He was the one preparing the way for something greater than himself. And he said that. I can't even untie his sandals. He's so much greater than I am. So it begins there, the picture of this kind of foreshadowing that something to come. Secondly, Jesus' baptism is the forerunner of his death and burial and resurrection. That's what it was. Why did it fulfill all righteousness? Because it was the right thing to do to show, I know what's coming. I know what this will be about. It's the image that will result in the reality of his death, burial, and resurrection. So his baptism in the Jordan River, not the Gunnison River, was the forerunner for his actual death. Again, it was not a, a literal death, it was a figurative death to show what was to come. And we could see that as we did earlier when Jesus spoke of his baptism after he got into his ministry as being, this is something I'm going to be submersed into, this suffering. And so it was very much about imagery, it was very much about a metaphor that he continued to live out. And so you have John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, you have Jesus' baptism, the forerunner or foreshadowing of his actual death, burial, and resurrection. And now we have Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as the forerunner of our death, burial, and resurrection. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the third in the chain of progression. Because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we now have the opportunity to die to ourselves, 
bury that old man and raise up to a new life. You see how this all works? The imagery, the foreshadowing, the themes, all these things that are so essential. The New Testament uses words like types and copies and shadows. What they really are, one author I read put it this way, they're like visual aids. Visual aids, we all need visual aids and God knows we need that. And so John the Baptist was a visual aid for what was to come in Jesus. Jesus' visual aid of being baptized was to prepare so that people could see, oh, that was about an actual death, burial, and resurrection that would happen later. His death, burial, and resurrection is a visual aid as to what we must do in response. Die to ourselves, be buried, raised to walk a new life. And then both what Jesus did, what we do in our death, burial, and resurrection now proceeds to the ultimate resurrection. Isn't that awesome? We will actually rise up with all mankind, but we will not just rise up, we will then go in a certain direction because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Isn't that a beautiful picture of imagery and, again, visual aids for us who are not so sharp? <laughs> I take you back to what I read earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23, there is an order to the resurrection. Jesus was the first, and now our resurrection comes after him. There's an order to this whole thing. It's a program. It's a, it's a, a play being played out, and it all connects together. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it's essential that we understand our resurrection to a new life. Ultimately, our resurrection to be in his presence all happens because of his resurrection. I pick it up in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. After that, the end will come when he, Jesus, will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. And then he goes on to likening our death and resurrection to a seed that is dead, that has to go into the ground and then comes out to new life. And the fact that the seed does not look like the ultimate plant at all, does it? The seed is just this little ugly thing that turns into a beautiful plant. He uses that, again, agricultural metaphor, and then he ends this way in verse 42. In the same way, the resurrection of the dead, our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. Okay, Steve, I got it, I got it, all right? Don't beat it to death. There is this process, this, there's this imagery that just flows as it does with Jesus all the time. And so you may be wondering, so what? What does that have to do with me? Well, obviously, the resurrection affects you today. And the resurrection will affect you in the future. But the bottom line is this. You should, if you're listening, you should have this eternal hope. And if you're not living with that hope, then maybe you're not understanding how this all works. So beginning with John the Baptist and processing all the way till the time when we are risen to meet him in the sky, the great judge, there is a living hope that we live with. And that's, if people aren't seeing that in us, that's our problem, and it is a problem. We have a living hope. Are you experiencing that? I want to wrap this up by going back to John chapter 11, and you remember what was happening there. Jesus had a very dear friend named Lazarus, who he had been told was very sick, on his deathbed probably, and Jesus, instead of dropping everything and going and racing and healing him, waits a couple days. By the time he gets to Bethany, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus come out and they're frantic. Well, why did you take so long? He's been in the tomb. He's been in the grave for four days. And it's specifically Martha who addresses and kind of chastises him. As she did remember the other time when she was fixing stuff in the kitchen and chastised him. She basically chastises him, but listen to him. He does not get down on her, but here's what he offers her. John 11 verse 23. He says, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, 
even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Listen to what he's saying. I am, from my baptism to my literal death and, and resurrection, which you'll see in, a, in just a little bit, in a week, from that point, you now believe in me. You have life right now. This is the here and now. You will have life now. And you will have life in the future when you are resurrected. But don't miss that. I bring you hope that death does not have the final say. <laughs> because if you come through me, there is nothing but life, baby. Nothing but life. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came to give you life, and it more abundantly. I'm sure Peter was there listening that day, recorded in John 11, when Jesus spoke to Martha this way, because later he would write in 1 Peter 1, 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, resurrection, now, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the point. What difference does the resurrection make? It happened 2,000 years ago. What's the big deal? It gives us, the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope today and a new life today. So let's end with this great story. I probably shared it with you before, but it's so appropriate. In the middle of the 19th century, Dr. Louis Pasteur was uh, doing experiments on germ therapy, and it was believed by the French government that it was so dangerous that they exiled him outside of Paris. He didn't go far outside of Paris, he just went into the forest where he continued to experiment with this germ therapy. He happened to have a colleague who was working with him by the name of Dr. Felix Roux. Now, Dr. Felix Roux had recently lost a granddaughter uh, to black diphtheria, and it so bothered him, he just felt like, we gotta figure out how to help these people who are dying of black diphtheria. And so they worked together, and Dr. Roux came up with an idea. He did something kind of outlandish. He took a, a vial, or a bucket, actually, of germs of black diphtheria, and swabbed the nostrils and mouth of 20 horses that were totally healthy, beautiful horses, and he literally gave them a, a death sentence. And so then he said, one of these may overcome this disease. And so they watched these 20 horses, and it didn't take long before they began to die. After a few days, they all had died except one, and he was very sick almost to death and so they shut it down the experiment down the scientists went to bed told the attendant there if anything changes keep monitoring them but let us know well about two in the morning that one horse's temperature lowered a half degree and then a degree and so he went and woke up dr rue and and the others and they came in and they watched and by morning that horse had totally recovered from black diphtheria. Immediately, Dr. Rue took a sledgehammer and hit that horse, killed that horse, took the blood from that horse, who had overcome black diphtheria. And by the way, they had used so much of that germ that it could have killed literally thousands of people in Paris. That's the risk they took. They took that blood and they found their way to Municipal Hospital in Paris where there were 300 young infants that were dying of black diphtheria. They burst through the doors, pushed the guards aside, and they inoculated every one of those children with the blood of that horse. In the end, in the end, out of the 300 that had black diphtheria and faced certain death, only three died. That is 297 of 300 infants lived. Why? Because they had the blood of an overcomer running through their veins. You get the point. What a beautiful picture that is of what we have experienced. We have the blood of the overcomer. He overcame death. He took our sin and overcame it. And we have his blood running through our veins. And so we have life. Whereas we were sentenced to death, we really were. Romans 3.23 says we have all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of that sin is certain death. We have the blood of the overcomer running through us. That's the great news. But, but, you need to hear it one more time. Had Jesus not risen from the dead, it would not have mattered that he died on the cross. 
I know that's a strong statement, but listen to what Paul said again in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. The blood of Christ, as the perfect sacrifice, took care of our sins. But it had to be followed up with a resurrection from the dead, a defeat of death. We now have a faith that is not futile. In fact, this idea that Jesus rose from the dead must become the centerpiece of our faith. We have a lot of grandparents that are in our house churches. Grandparents, I want you to think about, and parents as well, should your grandchild or your parents, your child come to you and say, Mom, Dad, Papa, Mimi, why do we do church? Why, why do you read your Bible? Why do you pray? Why do we do what we do? Your answer to them is very important. Our tendency is to say, well, you know, we go to church because of the, the beautiful stained glass windows or the beautiful music. That is not why we do what we do. I don't read my Bible to get a pump up for the day. We do all that we do because, here it is, Jesus rose from the dead. I implore you to make that your standard answer. When anyone, whether it's a child, a grandchild, anyone asks you why you do what you do, this must be a simple and profound answer. Because Jesus rose from the dead. That's why we do what we do. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, there is no point in doing what we do. May that be what you hold on to in your heart and tell others about. It's not complicated. It's not sophisticated. It's not beyond anyone's understanding. Because Jesus rose from the dead, that's why I get baptized. That's why I have a new life. That's why I can't wait to come out of the grave. That's why we're here. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Have a great day celebrating that. The new life for now, the new life that waits us. It is a great day.